Just after the exam, before we because uh, before the kathina, so then we can uh, uh, finish the uh, uh, topics related to ultimacy, and I'll be starting uh, the course related to including karma from the next semester. So if you go to the uh, paragraph number five point three one, because last week I made a mistake, uh, I sent the handout with the wrong numbers. <coughs> so today we arrange all because the last week we have discussed all these what is mentioned in the today's handout but uh, the numbers are rearranged so 5.31 because we finished the sandha and sati last week today we are going to discuss about aloba adosa and tatra panchatata in this lecture so here we have three mentalities aloba adosa and tatra panchatata aloba is non greed it is a state opposite of greed the first thing we should know is aloba is not the absence of loba aloba is a state which is opposite or which doesn't allow loba to arise which doesn't allow loba to continue or this doesn't allow loba to come into our mind so normally uh, aloba is very important in the spiritual practice uh, when we consider about giving up giving up the sensual desires giving up the wealth for charity so we have to have the detachment towards these objects uh, which we got attached in the before it means normally a person attached to his wealth attached to his family his parents relatives so when he wants to give this money wealth if for charity so this attachment has to be abandoned it means the same wealth to which we attached has to be detached by means of aloba so if someone wants to renounce the world giving up the household life relatives parents and coming into a recluse becoming a recluse the same way the loba by which we attach the, the objects the relatives to whom we attach with loba has to be from the from them we have to get detached so detachment happens with aloba loba normally attached to the object like a glue aloba takes the object like the water in a lotus petal lotus leaf or a lotus petal it doesn't get absorbed it doesn't get stuck it can move very easily so aloba is a, a mental state it is quite difficult to understand sometimes but it is the detachment of the mind so anyone who wants to renounce the world he should have aloba towards these objects at the same time uh, when practicing asuba meditation like repulsiveness of the body the aloba becomes more prominent because we get detached from the uh, our body and to others bodies physical figures and this aloba is very important uh, plays a huge role in our spiritual practice uh, without uh, uh, developing aloba it is impossible for a person to attain noble hood and also to attain jhanas so that is a very important uh, mental state and it is also one of the roots of the mind like loba is a root in unwholesome side aloba is a root in the wholesome or the beautiful mental mind so if i read the paragraph 5.31 aloba is the mental factor which detaches from objects aloba does not allow loba to arise and suppresses it aloba is an is an opposite mental state to loba it dispels attachment as light dispels darkness while taking object loba sticks at it as like a glue whereas aloba takes the object not attaching to it as a drop of water on a lotus leaf or lotus petal aloba detached from the same objects upon which loba got attached to a person is capable in giving away his wealth which he attached to for charity only when he gets detached from it 
that means only when he has low aloba towards the same well which is like this aloba becomes conspicuous when developing asuba meditation it's very uh, becomes very uh, evident in us when we develop asuba meditation it should be highlighted that aloba is not the absence of loba this also should be known aloba is not the absence of loba loba as mentioned it is the mental state which suppresses and abandons loba and prevents loba from arising it prevents loba from arising and it keeps my mind in a detached stage it is it just keep the mind in a detached stage it's a, it's a different mental uh, property 5.3 uh, 3.1 as lo al loba is one of the main reasons for the continuation of the sansara Aloba is one of the prominent factors for the attainment of Nibbana. Hence, it is called Vivarta, Vivarta Mula. We get detached from all the conditioned realities, mainly when the Aloba is present. Normally, the wisdom has to arise to see the defects of the realities. At the same time, Aloba is the one which prevents us from getting attached. Beings are capable of renounce. Uh, to renounce all the sensual pleasures and follow the path to a liberation only due to aloba, so it is called nekamadatu. We get rid of the sensual attachment, sensual pleasures, and uh, beloved objects because when we have the detachment towards them. Aloba is made to root, root among mentalities. So one of the beautiful roots. Then we come to adosa. The same way, adosa is the opposite of dosa. Adosa is opposite of dosa. It means. Uh, adosa dispels dosa like heat dispel uh, like uh, heat dispels cold dispels heat so in the same way adosa is also not the absence of dosa it is a mental state which does, doesn't allow the dosa to come when in our practice adosa is very prominent as metta metta is loving kindness so dosa takes an object like when a, when a dog catches a hare, uh, a rabbit, it doesn't uh, loves it, it just, it just gets to kill it you know, in, a, in a very fierce way. In the same way, dosa takes the object very roughly, very harshly. Aloba, when a dosa takes that object, it takes like, it's like rubbing a mother touching her beloved son's head or child's head. It have a lots of uh, uh, feeling towards the object. It's very, very kind. It's very, very polite sort of thing. So this, when the adosa is present, is very easy to associate some person because uh, when uh, it doesn't, he gets doesn't get angry. So adosa is one of the very important mental factors for social association to develop good relationships with others. So uh, and adosa is also not the absence of dosa. It is a mental state which doesn't allow the mind to go into the uh, anger or to the hatred. So it's uh, a small explanation is given. Adosa is the mental state which does not allow dosa to arise and suppresses it. It is an opposite mental state to dosa. Adosa dispels dosa as cold removes. As cold removes, right? Uh, this with dosa as cold removes heat out of the two latter takes the object like a dog catches a hair whereas the para takes the object softly as a mother rubs her beloved child's head one aspect of adosa is called metta in the state of the mind that wishes for others welfare and happiness right it is very prominent. It should be noted that mere absence of dosa is not adosa. As mentioned, it is the mental state which suppresses and abandons dosa and prevents dosa from arising. Adosa is also called abhyapada dhatu. Abhyapada dhatu is like nekamba dhatu because it prevents the anger. Like aloba, adosa is also a beautiful root among the mental mentalities. In the concluding lesson of the uh, mental concomitants, I'll explain about these roots. There are unwholesome roots, wholesome roots, and how important they are to the practice. Because we don't much give emphasize about, about these wholesome roots in our practice. Because when a person is well established in the spiritual path, it indicates that his aloba, adosa, amoha are more powerful. Normally, when loba is strong, we get attached to object very strongly. When dosa is strong, we dislike or we start to hate some people, others. When moha is strong, we don't understand the truth. It's, it's, we, are getting, we are deluded. But when it comes to aloba and adosa and amoha, when they are powerful, what happens? Loba dispels 
The aloba dispels loba, like attachment. Adosa, non-hatred, dispels hatred or anger. Then wisdom dispels delusion. So when these three mental states are powerful or strong in our mind, they abandon the opposite mental states, opposite unwholesome mental states. So the mind will be enhanced in the spiritual bliss. So when the mind is enhanced in the spiritual bliss, what happens? The person uh, later starts to admire or to enjoy his spiritual path. So then he becomes well established in the spiritual path. Normally, when the unwholesome roots are more powerful, well established, we, for example, if you talk about loba, we get into an addiction. All the addictions in the world, like addiction to alcohol, addiction to gambling, and addiction to internet, all these happen when the loba is very strong, strongly attached to certain object. The mind cannot stay without it. Loba always needs, it's like a fire, it always needs some food. At the same time, when the aloba is powerful, when he is able to give up the objects and to remain without attaching, then he, because the, lo the fire of loba is removed by aloba, at that time he can enjoy the seclusion. He can enjoy without being, uh, uh, getting the entertainment like the sensual pleasures. So one, 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 uh, there's a nice sutta given by Buddha uh, about the Magandya. You can read this sutta in the Majjhima uh, Nikaya. It is very important sutta for uh, some person to understand what the Buddha's doctrine with related to sensual pleasures. This Brahmin called Magandya is a male, not the Magandya you find to accuse Buddha. She was a female. She was the queen of King Udena. But this is a Brahmin who held a view that the real liberation of a person is to satisfy the sensual sense organs. If someone wants to get liberated from the suffering, what he has to do is satisfy the sense organs as much as possible. This is the real liberation, he thought. This is the uh, getting rid of the suffering. So he really didn't like the Buddha. He even didn't like the like to talk with the Buddha or to see a place there. Because Buddha was always emphasizing about giving up, getting rid of the sensual pleasures and so forth. So there, uh, so, somehow there was a discussion because Buddha wanted to convert this person because he had lots of uh, good merits in the past life. So Buddha pers uh, purposely arranged a discussion with him and in the, during the discussion he, he mentioned that his idea is that the person should enjoy the pleasures as much as possible. Because if you don't enjoy the pleasures, you are in a burning, like you, we, we find it very difficult to live when we, when we don't get what we wish, what we like. So that is what happens if someone is addicted or really, uh, really likes some objects. At a certain time, when the time passes, at a certain time, we want to do that act or we want that particular object. So we feel, we feel, we feel very uncomfortable. So at that time, only by giving the object, only the feeding the mind with the particular object, we are able to satisfy our loba. So that is what his argument, Magandhya's argument is that you have to give the, feed the sense organs, uh, sense organs as much as possible with the desired objects. But the Buddha's question was, the Buddha's argument was different. He asked the question, now what do you think Magandhya? If some person has got rid of this desire of wanting, what do you think about such a person? Does he, does he need such objects? Then the, his, his uh, argument was, uh, he couldn't answer properly. He couldn't answer because he was talking because people have always had this desire. So to satisfy the desire, you have to feed with the relevant objects. So the Buddha's argument is, if someone has extinguished or quenched this desire, he has no pleasure for any sensual entertainment. For a such person, how do you think, does he need this object? So they need, he had to say, no, then we, are, we, we cannot explain about such a person. So what, what the Buddha wanted to emphasize is, so the, 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 behind the philosophy is, when the aloba is stronger, it dispels the loba. So then the person starts to experience the bliss of this practice. At that time, that is the moment he can enjoy seclusion. He can stay without the companions. 
he can stay without, for example, today's internet, or he may be able to give up all the entertainment and still be a, live a very simple life, and still may he may be able to continue without uh, drag towards sensual desire. So alopa, when alopa is stronger, it indicates that you are well established in the spiritual path. The same way Adosa and Amoha, I'll be explaining them in detail when we come to the concluding part of the uh, mental concomitant. So these Alopa, Adosa and Amoha are very important, plays a huge important role in the spiritual practice. At the same time, Loba Dosa Amoha plays a very important role in our continuation of Sansara. Right? So these are the Aloba and Adosa, uh, that is regarding the roots of the mind. So then we go to another Chetasika, which is not much discussed in our literature. It's called Patra Majataka. So this Patra Majataka is divided into few words. Patra Majat Atta Ta Tatra Vajatata. This is how the word is defined. Atta. Atta here refers, doesn't refer to self, here it refers to a nature. Here it refers to a nature because the same word may have different meanings in Pali and it's common to any language. Here it refers to a nature. What sort of a nature? Nature which remains in the middle. Majja is middle. So when we are talking about Majja, we always talk about avoiding the extremes. That is why we call Majjima Patipada, middle path. Middle path means not going into the extreme level of self sensual indulgence or self mortification. Right? So Majjima Patipada. So when we talk about the Majjima Patipada, another talk of Majjima Patipada is Patija Samuppada. In sort of practice, Majjima, the middle is the giving up the two extremes of sensual indulgence or uh, self mortification and practice in the eightfold path. So, when it comes to doctrinal wise, the two extremes are there is no self after death, or the self will remain continued forever. There is the self will not disrupted at this death or after a certain life, or the self will continue. It's called eternal view and, and view of annihilation. So, these are the two extremes doctrinal wise. If you look at the Kachayana Gotta Sutta, Buddha explains, Atiti Kachayana Eko Anto, Natiti Eko Anto. Atti and Nati here refers, doesn't refer to, it doesn't refer that they are exist or not. It's not talking about the existence of realities. In the Kachayana Gotta Sutta, Buddha mentions, someone holds that there is a self which exists forever, or there is a self which gets destructed at a certain time. So these are two extremes. If someone holds a self-view, you go into two extremes. Buddha mentions, I don't go into any of these waves. I preach the Dhamma in the middle and he preached the Paticca Samuppada. What the Paticca Samuppada is, is that causal relation. All non-self realities happen to continue because of causes. It's not a self that exists forever, neither a self that gets destructed at a certain time. So the doctrinal wise, Majjima is the Paticca Samuppada. You can see this in the Majjima, uh, in the uh, Kachayana Gotta Sutta. Then in terms of practice, middle is giving up the extremes of sensual indulgence and self-mortification. So here also when we call Majja, here we are talking about the Majja in the middle in all wholesome deeds. To come into a wholesome act, for the mind to become wholesome, it has to avoid two extremes. What are the extremes that the mind has to avoid in order to be in the middle? There are two extremes. One is uh, distracted nature, one is constra contracted nature. Contracted means the mind gets contracted, at that time it falls into laziness, it falls into sleep. It becomes, uh, the mind is shrink inside. So that is the one extreme. If the mind is too awake, too awake means too excited, it gets agitated, it gets restless. So these are two extremes. So for a mind to become wholesome, to become kusala, it has to avoid these two extremes and come into this middle name. So the nature which remains in the middle, 
making the mind to become avoiding two extremes is called tatra majjatata so that is a that is a, another unique nature found in all the wholesome deeds all sanchitas if this nature is not found it is like balance in the mind how does it balance it doesn't allow the mind to go into two extremes one extreme is the kusita the laziness one extreme is the agitated distracted nature another type of extreme is sometimes the mind becomes more coarse it means like uh, coarseness coarseness is like it's look up it doesn't it is very rough it is not very uh, how do you call uh, it's not very uh, mild or it's not very uh, like like wet sometimes it's too happy so some is too cross cross or too happy so at that time when the mind is too much rough it doesn't enjoy the spiritual practice called arati it doesn't enjoy if it is too happy it falls into sensual craving or unwholesome craving so the mind has to be balanced in order to become wholesome so likewise this there is a nature which doesn't let the mind to go into these two extremes and to be in a neutral stage we call it a neutral we can translate it as a neutral stage so this neutral stage the chetasika which makes the mind to be in this middle stage is called tatra majjatata right tatra majjatata so when we go into the uh, how to say go into the grammatical formation we call it majjik majjata majjata is the chitta which which has this nature the nature which remains in the middle the chitta which has this nature is called majjata ta is a suffix which gives the meaning of uh, its abstract nature the chitta is majjata the nature of the chitta of being so in a, in a neutral state majjata ta it refers to the chetasika then this word tatra means it is translated as tesu tesu kusala kamesu it means it is found in here at these and those every wholesome deed so this nature if i translate it in a simple manner the quality of the mind the mental concomitant of the mind which makes which makes it to be avoiding extremes and to be neutral in the sense of wholesomeness is called tatra majjata ta so this is a very important mental state and it is found in all the wholesome chittas that is why it's a sobana sadharana so when it comes to if you go to the 5.331 5.331 when it comes to the four types of sublime abodes upekha brahma vihara this tatra majjata ta plays a very important role so there are four types of spiritual abodes like uh, sublime abodes we call metta karuna mudita upekha metta is loving kindness you you wish for the others welfare karuna is you work to make the others free from suffering mudita is you appreciate others joy upekha is we normally call we become neutral so if we talk about this fourth aspect of brahma vihara new upekha brahma vihara this upekha brahma vihara it doesn't get the mind to get attached to the beings or it doesn't let the mind to dislike the beings so it remains in the middle to position it doesn't get attached it doesn't dislike the beings at the same time when the upekha brahma vihara is present it neither wishes for the welfare of the beings it neither works for the to save the other beings from suffering it neither appreciate the success of others it starts to become neutral con considering that the beings become successful or unsuccessful based on their karma based on their action here karma doesn't mean the past karma always there are two types of karma i'll be talking about this when it comes to karma lesson there are two types of karma karma of the present sphere karma of the future sphere. it means process pure karma means when we do our actions we get good results if we work hard we will earn money if you live a good virtuous life you will get a reputation this reputation is not a vipaka of your act 
This is a normal cause and effect relationship of our acts. If someone kills a human, he'll be in the prison. This imprisonment is not because of his uh, vipaka of his act. This is a result of it. Result means if we knock the knock the something, the sound will happen. The same way, if we do a good thing, we will get a good result from the society. We'll get a good reputation. If we do bad things, we'll be condemned about our act. So the future sphere of karma is the mysterious type that we do it, it's exclusive to the religious religious doctrine. We do something and a special result will come. If we do a good thing, a bad good result, do a bad thing, bad result will come. So these are the two aspects of karma. When someone is unsuccessful, either it is mostly it is because of his bad conduct or unwise conduct in the present 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 life. It means someone fails an exam or this becomes poor, not studying well, not working hard, becoming lazy. You cannot attribute to the past karma. This is his failure in this present life. Buddha has mostly admonished, mostly admonished about this aspect of karma. But unfortunately, we don't give much attention to that. It is not expressed as karma, that's the point. But if you analyze the doctrine, when he explained to monks, if you live virtuously, you will be happy as a monk. If you practice well, you will attain Nibbana. If you do good things, you will be praised by the society. If you, if you live a good, good life, your Sambrahmacharis, your brethren will start to respect you. These are all effects of your present act. It's not because of your past karma. So Buddha's most emphasis was given focus on this present sphere of the karma. Because the past acts, what you have done in the past, with the, there are effects of the past, but you cannot do anything for that, it's already done. So what the person has to most be, uh, be aware of is to lead a successful life. If you live a good successful life, there will be good results in the present, and they will bring a future result mysteriously in for the next life. That is a different case. So Buddha's more, Buddha have given, especially if you talk about the monks, he was mostly emphasizing to practice the sila, to practice the samadhi, practice a good virtuous life in order to get the attainment. He was emphasizing, if you don't practice, you will lose the opportunity. If you don't practice, at the end of your monk life, you will one day become sad that I lost this great opportunity of uh, being a monk and I couldn't practice. So he was, so when the person who is practicing this Upeka Brahma Vihara, he normally focuses on both the aspects. When someone is unsuccessful, it is, it, mostly it is because of his wrong conduct or unwise conduct in this person. Like sometimes, sometimes in some cases, it can be a result of the past karma. It's possible. And if someone is successful, it's mostly because of his good achievements or efforts in the present life, at the same time there is a good backup of the past commas. So likewise, a person who practices Upekka Brahma Vihara doesn't wish for the welfare of other beings, he doesn't go for the compassionate feeling, doesn't appreciate others' joy, but start to remain neutral in such a manner. So this neutrality is caused by this Tatra Majatata. Tatra Majatata doesn't allow the mind to go into such wishing and compassion or uh, appreciating feelings or like or dislike the beings and to remain as it is. But it, has, it is not just remaining. Upeka Brahma Vihara doesn't mean you are observing the beings and not doing anything. No, it has a certain contemplation. What is that contemplation? When he sees a person, for example, when a person, a criminal has gone to the prison, for example, you cannot do anything to save him. At that time, he considers this is the act of his, this is the result of his own act. So this allows not to us to get sad about him or not to be happy about him. Because if you get happy about his punishment, this is also unpossible. So likewise, this Upeka Brahma Vihara has a good contemplation. And when someone is successful, he thinks about that success has been attained through the, uh, how to say, through the uh, his success. But it doesn't mean Buddha Buddhism doesn't always emphasize, only emphasize to practice Upekka Brahma Vihara. The person has to practice loving kindness, compassion, and appreciating joy and Upekka Brahma Vihara. So it's like normally in the jhana level, after you have attained the all three stages of like 
after practicing loving kindness, after developing compassionate feeling, after uh, developing the appreciative joy, and the last time you will, we are supposed to practice this uh, economic feeling. Otherwise, it, people will start to always give up their responsibilities and not to support the society and just to become just neutral. No, all the four attributes has to be practiced, but we should know when to develop them. So when have we have the opportunity to help others? At that time, it is not the time for to practice Dopeka Brahma Viha. It is the time to practice compassion, compassion feeling. When we, when we see uh, someone actually needs our help or one of our uh, per persons are successful, students are successful at, the time, at that time, we have friends are successful, at that time we should have appreciated joy. So likewise, uh, we have to consider about the social atmosphere and our relationships in uh, developing these four sublime abodes. Sometimes, uh, one of my friends once said, because he had a grudge towards another friend, like, uh, didn't like the friend. So I asked him to practice uh, metta. No, he said, I am practicing upe kao. So it's like, it's, it's like, because since it is difficult to get the uh, uh, loving kindness, he thought, okay, it's easy to practice one. But this is a wrong decision. In such a case, if you have anger towards someone, you have to develop the loving kindness. So Upeka Brahma Vihara is developed when you don't have the, for example, after you practice these first three stages as a culmination of your practice, Upeka Brahma Vihara is done. So what I want to emphasize is that at that time also Tatra Majatata plays the role. Then this Tatra Majatata again you is found in the Vipassana practice. In the Vipassana practice also, when we are doing the practice, our faculty should be balanced. It means our sadda and wisdom, that faith and wisdom should be balanced. Effort and uh, concentration should be balanced. If we don't balance these faculties, mind will go into two extremes. If the faith is too much, he will start to uh, do things like unnecessary things, uh, and he will get a uh, he will not start to respect things unwisely. So there's a story given for this example, but because uh, in our in, in Asian cultures, normally you don't put the legs towards a uh, respected object. Again, you can see it in Myanmar also. It's, 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 it's considered as a, it's a gesture, it's an unpolite gesture. So what happened was, the story goes, one person went to the Mahavihara in Sri Lanka. It's Mahavihara is uh, surrounded by many pagodas and lots of sacred objects are found. So one time he started to sleep, on one direction. So he felt I'm putting my legs towards the Mahasethi. Then he changed the direction. So there is a Mahabodhi on the other side. So then he put the legs to the other side. Then there was another Chethi. So likewise he was putting all the four directions. Then he started to stand. Then he found, he remembered, according to the literature, there is a stupa of the Naga world in the, uh, on the earth. So then he started to uh, stay on the on head. Then he remembered there is a stupa, according to the literature, in the Deva world. Then he couldn't do anything. So, so likewise, if the sadha is too much, without balancing with the wisdom, we come into an extreme level and it is, it is not practical. So it has to be balanced. So when the wisdom is too much, what happens? Some people get really, we call it like, they start to become a little bit cunning, for example. They would start to think, whatever the actions that, for example, normally we have to, when we do the wholesome deeds, we have to make some efforts, bodily and verbal efforts. So when the wisdom is, when someone has understand the doctrine proper doctrine, but when he goes to extreme level, he will start to because uh, once I was told by one of my one of my uh, known monks, he said like while I was cleaning the pagoda, he said whatever you do uh, uh, in the pagoda, I can get the same merit by here thinking about it. That was a wrong idea. It means it's it's not only the chitta which works because. I would I, I, I just kept silent because I had I, I could have re-questioned him. So what is the difference of this these two chittas? Your chitta is not going to move your body. I was able to answer in Abhidhamma. Your body is not going to be able to make the vinyati and do the work. So these two chittas are completely different. So likewise, when the wisdom is sometimes when the wisdom someone doesn't balance the wisdom wisdom with the faith, what happens? He starts to go into extreme and start to think all the things happens with the mind. So you don't need to give charity, you don't need to give do any good things, but only just arousing wholesome thoughts in the mind, like wishing to charity, wishing good for others is just enough to accumulate 
the same merit while someone is doing that. It's completely a wrong idea. When you are thinking to give something or when you are actually executing the act, doing the act using the body or the words, the strength of the mind is completely different. So the results will be different. So someone does the act, he gets more merit. When someone just thinks, he doesn't get the merit. It's not a complete act. He may just get for wholesome thoughts, he may get a merit, but he will never get the merits of accumul uh, completing a certain act. Because the act was not done. When you are talking about a kamma, it has to be taught in a, in a very complete way. Uh, a kamma to be accomplished, there are certain facts that has to happen. Our mind is one thing. Some acts needs the verbal and physical involvement. And for some acts, the other party also needs to get, uh, uh, get involved into the completion of that. For example, like killing. Kill, for the killing to become complete, the other person has to die. Otherwise, it is not a full karma. So likewise, when someone just knows the doctrine to a partial level, he may think that everything happens with the mind and he may start to ignore all the good activities and comes into a very ignorant form. Like every, So everything happens in the mind, with the, with the mind, so he may avoid all the wholesome good activities. So this is called, this type of uh, fault is called uh, a sickness that happens with the medicine. It's a very difficult to cure it. So likewise, when the wisdom goes to extreme level, it's not a high wisdom, it's a corrupted level of uh, wisdom comes into a corrupted level and it is an unwholesome, wrong ideologies they created. So that's why the wisdom and the uh, faith has to be balanced properly in our spiritual practice. When you go into the vipassana meditation, especially the concentration and the effort has to be balanced. When the concentration is too much, while we are meditating, or if the effort is getting lower, automatically people fall into sleep. You can experience this in many places. It's not the mostly the thing is, not everyone who sleeps in meditation is not because of high concentration. There's a different case. But even at the level when you go into uh, in a higher stage, if the virya is not balanced with the concentration, the mind will fall into sleep. If the mind is too energetic and not balanced with the concentration, it will get agitated, it starts to become restless. So therefore, in the practice of vipassana, these two faculties has to be balanced. So that is done by this Tatra Majjatata. And also in the Bojanga practice, Buddha mentions like the wisdom, happiness and effort has to be balanced with the concentration and uh, tranquility and also with this Tatra Majja. They, they are the tranquilizing part. So these things have to be balanced with each other and that is done by Upeka Sambhujanga. So these are the very important facts about the Bhujanga, Tatra Majjatata. So in a brief, Tatra Majjatata is a reality which is needed for all the wholesome mentalities because it doesn't let the mind to go into two extremes and remain in a wholesome manner. And this is found in the four sublime abodes, abodes as uh, that uh, Upeka Brahma Vihara and it's also found as Upeka Sambhujanga in the Vipassana practice, Samatha Vipassana practice. Then they have given another example, uh, explanation given, uh, given by late Vredukani Chandavimala Mahatero. It is a different way of explaining Tatra Majatta. The first way I explained based on Lady Seattle's Paramatta Deepani. So this explanation is found by a Sri Lankan Mahatera who is well renowned about in Abhidham. According to him, what does he mean by Tatra Majatata? He starts to, he tries to explain, Tatra Majatata means the balance of the speed of the Chitta Chetasikas. Chitta Chetasikas, mind and the mental concomitants, have their own unique functions. Like Pasta touches the object, Vedana feels the object, Chetana is the power, like by they are the unique functions. When these unique functions are performed at the same time, automatically a common act is also happening. The example is given when people are doing their own work while building a house. Some person mix the concrete, someone brings the bricks, someone brings the sand or do their individual work. When all these acts are collectively happening, the house will get constructed. In the same way, when the mind and the mental states perform their unique acts, 
There is a cohesive act which happens naturally. These acts are like the taking, giving, talking, and all these physical and verbal acts. So, what he suggests is, so when two people are doing a collective act, two or many people are doing collective, for example, if people, some are carrying a desk, two people are carrying a desk, if they want to do this act properly, both have to walk in the same speed. So if someone speeds faster than the other, this act cannot be done properly. So in the same way, in the wholesome mental states, there is a balance of these mental acts. So that's why the action can be done properly. Then the Thera also questions, this sort of balance should be found in the unwholesome mental state and he gives a question mark how to explain it. And I have found in another book, in the Srinthani's book, by Dr. Amadar Amaradas of Nepala, he suggests that, in the, in the following this same explanation, he suggests that in the unwholesome mental states, their speed is not much balanced, so they are very un... Uh, they are undecent, they are, they are not decent, they are in a very unbalanced manner. That's why in the Akusala mental states, uh, when you find the Kusala mental states, they have a very good composer and they are very balanced with each other. When you come to the Akusala mental states, they are not balanced with each other. So that's why we find in the Akusala mind, it is most is always distracted, especially by the Uddhacha. So there is another way, that's why it's, it's another way of explaining Tatra Majjatata, but I most prefer the way I explain because it shows that how Tatra Majjatata can be found in all wholesome chitras. So this is the lecture for the lecture one, so 21. So we discuss about Aloba. Aloba is the mental state which suppresses Loba. Adosa is the mental state which suppresses Dosa, anger, Tatra Majjatata doesn't let the mind to go into two extremes and makes the mind remain, remain in a middle state which is required for the wholesome state, wholesome, wholesome, wholesome chitta to happen. And then this uh, Tatra Majjatata acts as the Upekka Brahma Vihara and Upekka, uh, Upekka, some Bujanga Upekka. These are the points. If you have any questions. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like uh, at the end of that, he comes into a wrong idea. It's like a wrong view. So it, it happens with the wisdom. He learns the doctrine, but he, he is not matching it with his personal practice and experience. So it comes into a wrong. So that means at that level, we don't call it wisdom. We don't call it wisdom. It's unwholesome mental state. But it happened through wisdom. Since it was not balanced with faith. In the first example also, the one who gets uh, really distracted by too much faith, at that level it's not faith. It's not faith. It's called Buddha Pasannata. It's like uh, unwise type of uh, a belief. Things too much. For example, if you give me examples. Just the example you mentioned, uh, no action, but just uh, only single. No, no, no. That is that is not a problem. But this person starts to defend himself, starts to advocate. That's the problem. For example, if someone asks, okay, let's go and do some charity, clean the house. No, it's not necessary to do. I will, I will. It's like it's it's mixed with emotions. It's not a it's not a complete pure thinking. He will start to defend himself and try to uh, use it as a shield, something like that. So that yeah, 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 that's fine. Right. But it started with wisdom because he's using the, what he studied in the beginning. So he initially started with wisdom and it ends up with the wrong idea. So that's why it's, it's, it's something that which happens with the uh, sickness which, ha which happened with the medicine. Since it was not balanced. Yeah, please. Please raise your voice, you cannot hear. In my country, people always say if you have too much data, too much wrong present, and if we 
Do you hear the question? I think how everyone heard the question, right? right. <laughs> Not exactly, okay, I'll repeat the question. So in his country, his mother is from Lao, so Mitta, he says that there is a saying that you should not practice metta, loving kindness to evil person, right, bad person. Otherwise, he will use the opportunity, right, and start to cheat you or start to uh, uh, overcome you, right, like something like that. Takes advantage out of you. Takes advantage out of you. Yeah, this is, uh, and he asked the question just metta should be involved uh, together with wisdom, this obviously, right? It has to be uh, practiced with, uh, how to say, wisdom. And there are two, uh, there are few types of metta. Metta that you can develop with the mind, for example, if you go to your quarters and have a pleasant, uh, someone is actually evil or doing bad, to you, bad things to you. When you, you can develop the metta towards him in your quarters or lonely. But there are another few types of metta. Metta kaya kamma, vachi kamma, mano kamma. So when you are practicing mano kamma metta to him, which is not a problem because no one is going to know that you are developing a good mind towards him. This wisdom faculty is necessary when you are going to associate or deal with him. So while you are doing the kaya metta kaya kamma and metta vachi kamma, right? So it has to be associated with wisdom, but it doesn't mean that you have to abandon your metta towards him. Thing is, when he is going to use the opportunity, you have to be strict on it. It's not just, it's not the giving up the metta. For example, I'll give you a simile. One time, there, there is a story, it's a sutta mentioned. One bhikkhuni started to get attachment towards Venerable Ananda. And she actually wanted him and she wanted to have sex with him. So she, she started to uh, bring Venerable Ananda towards her. So what she did was she pretended that she didn't come for the Dhamma toss and she pretended that she is sick. So Venerable Ananda had to come to her. So because she was pretending and but she was, she was just pretending to bring, bring him to her. Venerable Ananda had all the metta towards this bhikkhuni. But when he came there, he just preached, no, this is not allowable, this is not a good thing, and this is never going to help to our spiritual practice. So this sort of strict stance, stance didn't make Venerable Ananda to be angry with that bhikkhuni. So he just explained the, what is good and what is bad, but still he had the pleasant feeling towards her. So it doesn't mean that. So I'm not. I'm always. I'm not saying that even someone tries to uh, get the benefits out of you or to try to overcome you using the opportunity. And even at that time, you have to be strict and you have to uh, don't let him use you. But still, we have to maintain our good mind. So in Buddhism, it is never encouraged. Even someone is doing a bad thing. You can prevent it, you can stand for your own rights, but with a pleasant mind. It is not necessary for the person to act angrily. But he can directly say that what is good and what is bad. So the thing that what I found was, when someone, we normally, when the things are going wrong, we, there are two ways to express our negative feeling. We just say it directly with a pleasant mind or we express our anger. So the thing is, when we, ex when we say that we don't like it through anger, what happens, the, the other impression that goes to the other side is, he always have a, because the first people always like to show the other's fault. They people don't like to accept our own fault. That is the nature of our human beings. We all, all, all are same. So when someone says that you are doing a fault with anger, what happens is, the other person has a has seized your own fault because because you got angry so being angry is not admirable so when the information was given that you are wrong with anger his mind always starts to think about the way he said not the information he gave but think if you can say this same information with a pleasant mind with clear-cut reasons and you are just saying that this is wrong but with a pleasant mind the, the other person have no opportunity to find a fault in you. So he just have to accept the fault. So that is what happened when Buddha rebukes the monks. 
Some monks have done various bad things. When they come to the Buddha, he starts to say, you, uh, the empty person, Moga Purisa, who had not attained anything, what you have done? You have done a great damage to the Sasana and this will even affect the other monks. So when he says with this a compassionate mind, with a pleasant mind, without any anger, so the monks doesn't feel that the Buddha has gone out. Like, otherwise, if he gets angry, monks will start to talk about that the Buddha was angry at it. So there's a fault. But when there is no such a even such a fault in the Buddha, only thing the monk, the accuser has to accept is his own fault. So this is a point that normally we don't understand. So we think when we express it through anger, he will become afraid and he will not do it. But actually, he will have a negative aspect towards us. We will not care about it, but that is what happens. If we really want to give a benefit to him, if, we, if a parent want to give the real, real benefit to a child, if they can say it in a strict manner, I'm not saying to become fragile, strict, very strict about his stance, but with a pleasant mind, Un, uh, and mind without anger, this will implant, this will give the, the impression that it gets is that they, they find that the fault is in, only in their side. I did the fault, even this person didn't get angry, he just mentioned it correctly and he has no, no way to run away. Otherwise, the mind is when a fault is, when someone points out our fault, we always try to get out of it. A nice way to get out of it is you find a fault in the other person. If, the, if, the, if he say it in anger, right, if he say it in anger, he finds, he, it becomes his object. Now, this person became angry, so this is his fault. So, so I think you got the point, right? So, when you say uh, too much metta, uh, metta means, yes, metta has to be done with wisdom. But I'm not talking about the mental metta, you can... You don't need to go to the uh, room and someone does not go to the room and start developing that negative feelings. The metta, mano, kamma, kaya, vachi, kamma has to be developed all the times. But if you find that that person is going to use this opportunity, that time you have to use the wisdom and be strict, but still with a mind without anger. That is how I see it. Any question? No? Okay, okay. Yeah. Five minutes there. I was negative Yeah. Yeah. But is it maybe perform the movement? Perform the body physical action and verbal action. Oh, oh, okay, okay. No, no, no. I, 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 my idea was, someone would say, it's not differentiating physical, mental and verbal actions which is strong. No, not in that manner. Someone would say, if someone says, we give dana, we have a certain feeling of giving up. The same merit can be attained without giving dana, he is giving dana with mind. This is, a, this is a very, very use, use how do they, I would call a useless argument, right? He's giving dana with mind, but he's not giving up anything, right? He's giving his property from mind, but property is still with him. This is a useless kind of argument, right? So in that sense, I would call that giving the dana by your mind, because you're not giving anything, everything is with you, right? So this dana is, there is a wholesome thought, that thought is very big, when you compare to actually giving what you have. When you're actually giving, your mind is giving something, right? You have to give up it. But here you are keeping your old stuff and you are just giving it out of mind. Like I give my pain, I give my, you can give hundred times. This is a, this is, this is a useless kind of a thought. It is a good in the sense of developing wholesome deeds, but this is not a come at all. This is not a dana at all. Uh, when you are a poor person, you always uh, just a little uh, coffee. But uh, you think this, for example, you think this, a single rice is a big mountain of rice. Oh, okay. But it's not true, huh? <laughs> yeah, but you, with this uh, single, 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 single,
No, it cannot be. It cannot be. According, according to Theravada tradition, it cannot be. Because the amount you offer, if you offer two rupees and if you offer one rupee, offering two rupees is more powerful. If you offer 50 chat and if you offer 1000 chat, offering 1000 chat is more powerful. Can you think like when you are offering 5,000 chat, can you think you are offering 10,000? It's, 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 it's just cheating yourself. Huh? It's, it cannot happen. Because your mind knows it's just 5,000. Maybe for a different person. Like, uh, for some person, uh, 1,000 will be very, very ah, That is a different case. Yeah, what he's saying. Now, a person who has only 10,000 chat offers 5,000. A person who has 1,000, uh, 1 million chat offers 10,000. So then this is the way of dealing is different. Right? That is different. But you are offering just 5,000. You are thinking just 10,000. This is, I think this is not a, nothing to, it's, it's just, it's, it's nothing to worry at all. It's if just you're offering 5,000. When he is thinking so, if he is thinking For example, I would call in this manner, uh, someone kills a tiger, kills a chicken. He thinks he's killing his mother. Will he get a, a kakusala of killing the mother? No, it's not going to get. So the action, the thing that you are involved, has a, it has an effect of your act. In this manner, for example, if you're thinking in that way, a person kills a chicken. And if he thinks he's killing his mother, is he going to get the result of killing a mother? No. His mother is still alive. He killed just a key chicken. Right? So your perception idea is not going to affect. Because your mind knows you are, you are doing something like that. Why is there not to say that is because he cannot really regard this if he, then how can you regard 10,000, 5,000 chat as 10,000? What is the what is the logic here? So it is just depends on how well he can think like a chicken. Yeah, if, that's why I say if he can think about a chicken like a mother, right? If he's capable of doing it, the no, argument. It depends on whether this chicken is real mother or not, or whether this this rice is real, big as big as mother. Yeah. No, it depends on this. Only even on this mind is uh, strong enough and uh, serious enough or not. What do you mean by that? Because you are offering a single rice, you are considering it as a big mount, yeah. mountain, I mean, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, when, uh, so what is the what is the logic to think it as a big mountain? If because it's, it's, it's the amount of rice. This mind is strong enough okay. and serious enough. Okay. Then so that's why I'm asking the counter question. So that's why I'm asking the counter question. You are, he is thinking that he is serious enough and strong enough to consider to consider the chicken as the mother like or some, some way okay? Really Think, uh, is he committing the matricide? I am asking. No, it's not committing matricide. Because he is killing a chicken. So we have to come into the actual reality. It's not just the mind he is killing. Yes. If I understand you correctly, then like like the cultivation of virtue and the accumulation of merit are like two entirely separate equa equations. Like they may overlap, but like the accumulation of merit is based on absolute value. Yes. Like if you give a mountain of money, this is just more for yeah. your merit. But in terms of the cultivation of your virtue, if you're a person with 10,000 chat and you're very poor and you give away 8,000, you're giving away 80% of what you have. Yeah. Then you've developed, you know, your your sense of generosity, yeah. you know, greatly more than the man. But, yeah. but 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 the key is just that they are two separate things. Yes, yes, we can say yes. It's like in if you yeah, it's like if you consider it as a big thing, like something that you uh, you are that you are giving according to what you have, right? So you are yeah, you are developing a very high virtuous quality in that. But the merit is gained, as you said. According to the how do you call it uh, actual amount? Yeah, the absolute. The absolute amount what you give. Yes. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to say. Like you develop the quality, right? If you say the, if you're thinking about uh, thinking about something as a lump of I, I still don't get this logic. 
right? You still don't get it because you are still offering something uh, lump of thing, right? So. But he's actually giving a little bit, no? So you cannot deny that also. <laughs> you cannot deny this, no? He's not giving a amount of rice actually. Yes, but he's talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So at that time, the same food, the offering of the same food is Yes, yes, that is also something. Yeah, for example, another extreme example Mandi is giving, like you offer a rice, a packet of rice now, you offer the packet of rice you have in the feminine, only packet of rice you have. Surely the merit is different, right? Because you are giving up absolutely the same price, right? And the thing is, like, okay, now it's, it's going on. <laughs> so, according to my understanding, the absolute, right? Absolute, uh, absolute amount also matters for the merit and the, the status of mind. Right? I'm still not talking about thinking something as something else. I'm not talking about that. At the status of the mind. So when someone is giving, for example, someone gives 10,000 chat, he has a lot of money, one gives 10,000 chat, out of 2,000, he's giving half of the belt that he has. So he is getting actually 10,000, in the absolute amount, he is getting for 10,000 chat. But the status of mind in this moment, he's giving up, is, is powerful than here. Because he is giving the half of the wealth that he has. Right? He's given the half of the wealth is there. And also, this now when you say the accumulation of merit, this also contributes the accumulation of merit, and this also contributes the accumulation of merit. Right? This also can the reason why I say this status, because when we call about the level of the Kama, it depends on three things. One is the amount, the absolute amount what you are giving up. The level of your mind, like means how much joyful you were, how much eager you to give the dana, how, how, how wise you were in this dana, and here how much sacrifice you are making towards the dana. So at that time the mind is in a different state. So actual accumulation happens with the mind. So this also contributes to the dana, this also contributes, then the last part which contributes is the receiver. The quality of the receiver. You give a dana to a rarahant and give dana to a buddha, real buddha. So the, his quality also contributes. Right? His quality also gets contributes. So, so these all three actually contribute to dana. So what I'm saying is you cannot deny this, the absolute amount it also has a validity. The merit will be accumulated by that, right? And status of mind, when you accumulate, like you are giving something, this also, this is something that is personal that you are developing, as I said, something that you develop virtuously. But this also contributes to karma because you are doing the karma. When you say the accumulation of merit, the level of the mind also contributes to this. So we normally say someone just give a dana out of carelessness. Someone gives the dana with full respect. Someone gives the dana thinking about the benefit of this person. So these are three levels of dana. Same price you are giving. So since the status of the mind is different, like if you give it with full respect and really compassionate towards that other person, or someone gives the same money because the society, society pressures him to give. So the two levels of merits are different in that case. So that is why I include the status of the mind. 
Then the receiver is a different case, it's a very uh, something other than that. So uh, when you give up dana, like uh, as you said, then at that time he is developing a now at that time the development of develop uh, development of virtue it increases. Development of virtue increases when you are making such kind of sacrifices. That is something that is you have personally developed. That you have personally developed. So yeah, these all three contribute to the merit. That's how I feel it. Any questions? So what what Sal is uh, what your suggestion is? If you are thinking this ten thousand as fifty thousand, I have. I think the point is that uh, I think the idea behind it might be that uh, based on your imagination, you will develop more joy, and then you have more joy. Okay, the that makes problem. But for but me, I, I cannot do it because I, I know that absolute amount is this, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe some other people are able to do it, but for me, I can do it actually. Right. I think we can't avoid that. <laughs> you're getting 50 and your thing is 50,000. I don't think this is. Right? I think we can do one half. Just enough. In May. Okay, anyway, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll take this discussion in the Kamma lessons. It will be quite interesting there. Eh? So I'll take it to the Kamma next semester. So we'll stop for a give a break and start.